Good day and welcome to today's webinar on how government organizations can quickly enforce mobile app ban. We are glad that you are able to join us today. This webinar is brought to you by Zimperium and Merlin Cyber. Zimperium is a global leader in mobile device and app security, offering real-time on-device protection against both known and unknown threats on Android, iOS, and Chromebook endpoints. Zimperium's technology protects mobile devices from device, network, phishing, and application attacks. For 25 years, Merlin has supported U.S. government with technology solutions and services. Merlin scouts leading cybersecurity technologies and brings world-class innovation to the U.S. public sector. And we partner with Zimperium to provide real-time protection on mobile endpoints. My name is Miguel Cian, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Technology at Merlin Cyber. At Merlin, I lead a team of cyber architects and engineers that help U.S. government evaluate, test, integrate, and deploy technically vetted cyber solutions that are designed to advance critical mission requirements. With me today is Kern Smith, uh, Vice President of Sales Engineering at Zimperium. Hello, Kern. Hey, Miguel. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So for our webinar this morning, our agenda for today follows the mobile threat posed by risky applications. We're going to discuss the various ways that organizations are solving for this problem. And then lastly, we'll conclude with Zimperium's comprehensive mobile device and application security solution. If you have questions during the webinar, please post them on the Q&A section. So let's get started. So the first question uh, in this conversation, Kern, um, I'd like to, to maybe turn it over to you to further understand the scope of the mobile threat that's faced by government organizations today. Yeah, appreciate that, Miguel. And and first off, my apologies. Uh, I think like everybody, uh, having a bit of home renovation going on, uh, as we're all working from home now. So if you hear any uh, screwdriver sounds in the background, again, my, my apologies on that. So. We'll try to keep uh, keep the noise to a minimum. But yeah, it, you know, I, I think what's going on right now is that organizations, as they're looking at the workloads that they're putting onto these, you know, these mobile devices, which are really kind of the, the modern endpoint, if you will, um, organizations are also realizing that these devices are staying with users wherever they go. And the question then becomes not just, hey, is the device jailbroken or rooted, right? That's kind of a standard stock question. It's now getting into what's the risk of assets that are installed on the devices? And the big risk, uh, the big, biggest assets that are installed on the devices are third-party applications, right? So users going to a public app store and saying, hey, I want to get this application to use it. And it's not necessarily used for business purposes. It's social media purposes. It's communication purposes, those type of things. But those third-party apps, while they may not be traditional malware in the sense of, a spy spyware or a, or a bank bot or a Trojan or something along those lines, because of the way the app works or who controls the app, it raises some concerns. Most recently, TikTok has been in the news because of concerns the U.S. government has around, you know, what and how it operates and data flows and whatnot, but that's not really a conversation. It, the, the biggest concern for organizations is, hey, TikTok is kind of the starting point right, of where people are starting to think about third-party app risk. But the real question for a lot of organizations is, what, are, what about the other apps that exist on the devices, right? What are, what are these third-party apps doing? What access do they have? What can they get a hold of? Where, where are they sending data to? Because while, look, there is a perfectly legitimate reason for a user to have a messaging app, but you also may want to understand why does that game app that's on the device have access to creating a VPN, send, send data to a third, to a you know different national to a different, to a server that's located in maybe a potential non-ally country, if you will, right? What's going on with the access or controls of those third-party app risks? So that's really where organizations are starting to say, hey, look, it's moving beyond just true malicious stuff, right? the Pegasus of the world, the jailbreaks, the malware, et cetera. And now it's moving into third-party app risk. How do we A, identify that? And then what do we do once we identify what those risky apps are that exist in the environment? So ho hopefully, hopefully that helps out a little bit. 
Yeah, yeah, Karen, that's great. I mean, that reminds me, um, the Department of Defense uh, actually just a couple months ago put out a a report uh, suggesting that there is a somewhat of a material weakness with, with how their um, their users uh, are able to go to the public app stores and just download applications on these sometimes even government furnished equipment like their mobile devices. So it sounds like um, a tool like um, a mobile threat defense or, or um, mobile management can help um, enforce some compliance and some governance uh, on top of those uh, public app stores. Well, a- absolutely. And, and, and part of that is, is look, when we talk to organizations and we're kind of it, give a workflow, identifying what those risky apps are, are, are the first step, right? That's step number one. That's, you do that via policy, you do that via guidance from, from different third parties, you know, like the, uh, the executive order that came out recently on, on different risky apps. But the idea is, is you have to identify what the risk is first, right? But then it's, what do you do about that? And when you think about the way mobile devices work, there's really no, it's not like a PC where you can reach out and remove a binary from a mobile device in, in most broad use cases, right? So now it becomes, what's the objective? Well, objective truly is let's block data from being sent to that third party system, to that backend. So you have to identify what are the backends that that risky app is communicating to, right? That's that, And then you have to block not just that app from sending data, but increasingly in this ecosystem, you have other third party apps that may use a SDK or, or connect to those risky systems. Or what about the browser if the user is trying to sign in to the web application? So blocking, identifying the domains to block and then blocking the outright on the device becomes important. And then you get into enforcement, which is, hey, if the user still has that app or any other risky apps onto the device as part of the zero trust um, architecture, how do we enforce automatically some level of compliance to say, you're not going to get access to re- to sensitive resources if you still have this app on your device, even though we're blocking data from being sent off the device, we still need to do automatic enforcement. And then once the user removes the app off the device, we have to automatically also reprovision them, <laughs> give them access mm-hmm. back at that point. So it's these workflows that become, that start, that start being implemented that are incredibly important. And the reality is, is that trying to do this with different systems becomes very cumbersome very quickly because, okay, if I use one system to identify a risky app, then I have to use another system to add these apps, these domains into the block. And then manually, typically, I have, would then have to enforce the, the access controls or conditional access with a different system. It becomes a very cumbersome and, and manual process. Whereas with MTD, at least Supreme's MTD, we can automate a lot of this and use our intelligence to A, identify what those risks are beyond kind of the known stuff, then automatically block with our combination content filtering and local VPNs and things of that nature, and then automatically enforce compliance actions across the board. Got it. So if organizations are using uh, a mobile device management solution, would that be sufficient for enforcing some of these controls that you're describing here? The, the challenge is, is that an MDM at its core is a management solution and they are very good at what they do. And, and I say that very lovingly as, as somebody who uh, used to work at, I, I, as before I came to Zimperium, I actually spent uh, four years, uh, just under four years at uh, what's now Workspace One, but was then AirWatch. So I come from that MDM background. and. But, but the acronym is in the tools, it's a management solution, right? So from a management perspective, Indians are very good at, at once you give them a list to say, here's the device that has this app on the list, but then what do you do about that? Typically it's a report that then ties into another action. That, it just becomes very cumbersome and manual. It's not what they're designed to do, right? What they're really good at though, is integrating with third-party systems like an MTD solution where we can take our intelligence and say, in our system, here's the device that has an offending app on it. And by the way, here's the apps that could potentially be risky as well, which is, which is the whole, a whole other thing. And then using, um, using our automated capabilities, we can then block the access to the app and then tell the MDM, hey, this device has this app on the device, and automatically tell the MDM to take an action. So for us, the MDM is valuable from an enforcement standpoint, but we become the intelligence that tells the management tool 
what and how to do that level of enforcement. So what we have here is an example of, hey, let's identify all the apps that exist within a organization's inventory. And this is where even in a demo environment, I'm touching close to 70,000 apps. That's the scope of the potential problem here. It's, it's not about the known stuff or what's in the news. It's about what else could exist out there, right? So identifying what apps exist in the environment becomes very important. And then using things like policy capabilities. Uh, so for us, we have a, a combination of, say, app policies that we can leverage so that organizations can then use bespoke policies to identify what apps have certain capabilities or where are they communicating to at a, at a certain point? And so an example of this could be, hey, I want to identify every app that can create maybe a VPN as an example. Or maybe I want to layer that in and also identify, uh, just because China's been in the news recently, out of all those apps, how many of them actually communicate with the server located in China? Because that could present a potential risk to the environment, right? And then going from there, they can identify those apps and then, say, enforce different compliance policies if they wanted to. So in this example, I can say, well, let me go ahead and mark or say which apps I may want to say are out of compliance, as an example. And then identify how many devices actually have that app. What's the scope of the problem? And then using different policies and also, for example, our technical reports, I can go ahead and identify what are the domains that this app actually reaches out to? Which ones are specific to the application or maybe more generic, right? Because do I want to block Facebook? Probably not. Do I need to block Apple.com? Maybe not, but maybe I want to block a specific domain that's of interest to me that's specific to the use of this application. At that point, for our, for our customers, they can then choose to implement uh, what we call our phishing uh, capabilities where they can go ahead and say, hey, look, for this group of devices, because what I do on a BYOD device or BYOD, BYOAD device may be different than, say, a government-issued device at that, at that point. And I can go ahead and say, well, do I want to leverage an enhanced phishing content uh, filtering capability? And then do I want to have a specific list that's blocking specific sites beyond what's kind of categorized in general based off of the general categories? And from there, organizations can say, well, what are the, what's the list that I actually want to do to block specific sites or do any number of items? Maybe I have a compliance requirement that blocks certain sites based off of items that are in the news. So one full solution, I can identify the apps. I can mark them as out of compliance to track what are the apps that I want to create policies off of or tell the MDM to take certain actions on. And then using the content filtering, I can effectively block the device from communicating to those servers while also providing a larger sense of detections across not just the, the apps, but the content filtering, phishing, network intrusion protection, device, uh, being able to detect if the device is compromised as part of a larger mobile security strategy where definitely the MDMs are also part of it, but mobile threat defense becomes kind of the nexus for the compliance for the identification of risk and the enforcement and mitigation of that risk or, and or threat if it occurs. Yeah, that makes sense, Kern. Um, we do have a question uh, on the Q&A here. Um, this yeah. Imperium support both on-prem and SaaS. And then in regards ah. to SaaS, which is software as a service, uh, what are some of the, the compliance uh, requirements that you have around uh, things like FedRAMP or, or um, mm -hmm. IL-4 or IL-5? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, appreciate that. So first off, we do support both on-prem and SaaS deployments. Uh, that is actually part of our core capability. Um, the, uh, the reason we're able to do that is because our detection is designed to take place on device. And I won't get into kind of the larger Symbarium overview, but part of the value that a lot of customers find in us is that because our detection is localized on the device, we don't have the reliance of communicating to a centralized cloud system of any type. We have flexibility in deployments. Uh, so I'll kind of use some old uh, works, you know, AirWatch terminology, but we support both on-prem. We also have SaaS and we have different varieties of SaaS. We have shared SaaS environments. We also can do dedicated, what we call dedicated VPC or dedicated SaaS environments, where that environment is solely for the customer. And there's a lot of different varieties, you know, nuances that we can support as well based on the customer requirements. 
But a short answer is I've yet to run into a scenario where we can't support the customer, be it on-prem or SaaS or any kind of general environment uh, scenario. We have our, we are completely FedRAMP authorized. We've had our FedRAMP ATO since uh, I think 2018 or 2019. Somebody can call me out on that by checking on the FedRAMP marketplace. Uh, so it, we're very much, um, uh, very much in that ecosystem, I guess I should say. So it, it's, it, but the, the, one of our taglines and one of the things we really try to pride ourselves on is we want our technology to fit into organizations environment environments. We don't want organizations to have to fit our to, to have to change their environment to fit our technology. So it's things like the flexibility deployment integration with multiple different MDM types, uh, seam integration, just general enterprise grade uh, techniques that we have. Excellent. And then if I'm an organization today um, that I would like to deploy this technology, how easy is it to deploy and what would that deployment look like in your opinion? Yeah, uh, very easy to deploy candidly. Um, most organizations, uh, they most organizations are using an MDM of some sort or an EMM of some sort. So either MAM, or either the device is under MAM, mobile application management, or it's under MDM management. Um, the reality is, is that we can integrate with all the major MDM vendors under the sun, and I'll kind of show an example of that on the screen here. But with a combination of our integration with the MDM. Leveraging the MDM to push out our MTB application and a couple of other things, we can effectively uh, achieve a zero touch rollout. And what I mean by that is the user doesn't have to touch anything or activate anything. And we can actually get that rolled out and activated very, very quickly with no, with no real end user interaction required and essentially assure I, I, I will never say 100% because there's no such thing as 100% adoption, but very, very high adoption rates with very low level of effort required for organizations. Candidly, it's never really a technical conversation or, or te technical in nature. It's more of a question about policy and, hey, what is it that you want to do based off of our recommended best practices? Best practices. Fantastic. All right, Karen, those are all the questions I have here on the screen. Are there any questions? Uh... Oh, actually, I have another one. <laughs> Sorry, it just popped up here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, can we deploy your phishing protection without a VPN? Oh, sure answer is yes. Uh, and that's part of our enterprise integration is that we, we provide different varieties and flavors of phishing protection. Uh, some that use a local VPN, others that don't require a VPN. Uh, you know, a lot of it depends on kind of a customer's environment of what specifically we'd recommend. But the key thing is, is that we have many different flavors and configuration capabilities beyond what we would have out of the box that allow us to fit within an organization's environment. Great. All right, Ken, I think those are the, the questions that, that we have here. Um, any concluding remarks? No, just really appreciate uh, the time today, Miguel. And it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And hopefully uh, the audience found it helpful and, and some good information. And again, my apologies for the uh, technical difficulties on the, on the video thing, the, the joys of standing up a new office and all that fun, all that fun stuff. But uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, if anybody has any questions or, you know, if anybody would like to follow up to kind of talk about specifics of your environment or your use case, uh, please feel free to reach out. We always love helping out wherever we can. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Karen. I really enjoyed the conversation as well. And uh, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or to Kern Smith um, or at our websites at zimperium.com or merlincyber.com. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much.